Therefore, it's time for members' statements. The member from Renfrew and St. Pembroke. Thank you very much, Speaker. <clears throat> Today, I would like to begin with a quote from Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the United Nations. A genocide begins with the killing of one person, not because of what he has done, but because of who he is. As we begin the National Haldemar Awareness Week, I rise to remember the victims of the terrible famine in Ukraine in which millions of people were starved to death in 1932 and 33. Haldemar means murder by starvation. This intentional and targeted genocide of the Ukrainian people, which took the lives of an estimated 2.5 to 7.5 million people, many of whom were children, was perpetrated by the communist dictator Yosef Stalin to punish Ukrainians for resisting Soviet rule. Soviet authorities confiscated all food grown by the Ukrainian farmers. Although the harvest was rich, the Ukrainian people were forbidden to touch it. Anyone, including children, caught taking even a stock could be executed. Special brigade, brigade, brigades searched homes and forcibly took all food from Ukrainian people, ensuring a mass famine would ensue. While millions were dying of starvation, the Soviets took the wheat to took the wheat the Ukrainians had produced and sold it abroad. This genocidal famine was denied, ignored, and covered up throughout the 20th century. Today, the Russian government continues to deny that the Holodomor was a genocide. In the days ahead, many events will be held across Canada to commemorate the Holodomor. I will be honoured to attend one such commemoration this Saturday in Mississauga, organized by the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress, together with PC leader Patrick Brown. By commemorating the victims of the Holodomor, we remind Ontarians that we share a responsibility to ensure that similar atrocities never happen again. This week, I join all Ontarians, particularly Ontarians and Canadians of Ukrainian origin, in solemnly marking the anniversary of this crime against humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member from Hamilton, Thank you, Speaker. Today is Hamilton Day at Queen's Park. I grew up in the east end of Hamilton, home to the steelworks. For many, it was a hard life, but for people who worked hard, and many, were, many of those were able to forge a good future for their families. Those that worked in the steel mills knew it wasn't paradise. They recognized the dangers of working there, and it wasn't necessary and it wasn't necessarily the future that they wanted for their kids, so they made plans. They put money away for their kids' education. Instead of asking for big raises, they negotiated decent pensions and health care benefits for when they retired. Although the work was hard and dangerous, they were comforted that they had made the best of it to secure a decent life ahead for them and their families. Later in life, I moved up onto the mountain, an area in the city that I share with the highest proportion of steel retirees in the city. They are my neighbours, my friends, and their dream has turned into a nightmare. U.S. Steel has reneged on agreements that it made years ago. Through decades of service, the workers fulfilled their part of the deal, but U.S. Steel feels no obligation to fill its end of it. Health care benefits have stopped with no notice, and people are worried about their pensions. The government committed $3 million to a transitional fund for health benefits, but nobody knows where it is and how to access it. I urge the government speaker to confirm the process immediately and allow people this Thank badly you. needed funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize three remarkable women from Lamaru Clay Institute in my riding of Scarborough Aging Court who have contributed significantly to a stronger, more positive and compassionate Ontario. First, I would like to recognize educator Michelle Ford, who has been a teacher at Lamarck Collegiate for the past eight years. Ms. Ford views the classroom as a communal space where she and her student learn together. At Lamarck Collegiate, Ms. Ford and her students have received two grants, one for funding a, stu a student's wellness center, another to bring yoga to the school to further manage stress and promote physical activity. Ms. Ford oversees the Equity Club, a student-led committee that focuses on education, the student population, about social justice. For her outstanding contribution, Lamaru School, Ms. Ford received honorable mention in the Toronto Star Teacher of the Year Award this year. I would like to recognize two students from Lamaru Collegiate, 14-year-old twins, Miriam and Nivo 
at Raymond. Early this year, Marianne and Neville received the Governor General Karen Canadian Award for their outstanding work in promoting education and opportunity in Pakistan. They have visited Pakistan on several occasions, meeting with students from some of the poorest neighborhoods to speak with them about the power of education and learn about the struggles. Mr. Speaker, please join me in congratulating Miriam and Neville, as well as Ms. Ford, for their con contribution to Lamarus community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Member Stavis, the member from Leeds, Grenville. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. I rise to recognize Cadet Corporal Hannah Flynn of the 113 the Brockville Rifles Royal Canadian Army Cadet Corps. Hannah is from Jasper in my riding, and next week will receive the Cadet Medal of Bravery in a ceremony at the Brockville Armory. It's the Canadian Cadet Organization's highest honour. It is awarded to a cadet who performs an outstanding deed of valour in risking their life to save someone else. Hannah was recommended for this prestigious honour for her incredible bravery and selfless actions following a crash while travelling in a van with six family members. She suffered severe injuries when the van collided with a tractor trailer in April. But this remarkable 14-year-old's response in the aftermath reflected the courage and the character exemplified by the cadet program. With the van toppled on its side, Hannah freed herself and moved about inside, reassuring her injured siblings. As motorists arrived, Hannah passed her siblings into their care, but her elder sister, Sarah, remained trapped upside down. After unbuckling her, Hannah stayed with Sarah until paramedics arrived. Emergency crews could not initially reach them, so Hannah held an oxygen mask on her sister for 30 minutes until they were extracted. I regret that I'm unable to attend next week's ceremony due to my duties in the House, but I ask everyone to join me in recognizing this outstanding young person. In our own moment of crisis, Speaker, we should all aspire to summon the same courage that Hannah showed to put the well-being of others ahead of her own. What an outstanding role model, and we're so proud in Leeds Grenville to call Cadet Corporal Hannah Flynn one of our own. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the discussion of climate change is becoming increasingly a part of debate and discourse in this chamber. Today I attended a press conference held by the Premier and the Ministry of the Environment and Climate Change to speak about the most recent announcement of a climate change plan. Effectively today, Speaker, we had the re-announcement of a pending announcement. The high-level climate plan, in quotes, that was introduced today had no costs, no targets by sector, or details of implementation. Speaker, that was disturbing enough. But more disturbing was the apparent burial of 2020 climate targets. The whole focus in the 40 pages of documentation that was produced mentioned the 2020 target once. The discussion was about the 2030 targets and the 2050 targets. Speaker, I went through this with the run-up to Kyoto in 2012, the fact that governments wanted to move the target far enough away that it never really would be something that mattered in their term of office. Speaker, you understand, and members in this chamber understand, the seriousness of the crisis that we face on this planet in this society. To fail to meet the 2020 targets is a very significant matter. This government will be judged by its ability or its failure to meet targets that it set. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to uh, remember today a, uh, an incredible teacher, father, and uh, basketball coach, probably the best basketball coach in Canada for decades, Mr. Dan Prendergast. Dan was born in uh, London, Ontario, uh, the youngest of eight children, and he uh, came to St. Mike's where he taught, coached, and uh, counseled uh, the young man for over 50 years. He just died recently after a long battle with cancer. But Dan will be remembered for his incredible love of teaching, of coaching. Uh, he basically uh, made basketball what it is in uh, Toronto today. I know today we hear about the Raptors and the great fan following. 
when Dan built basketball up with his basketball clinics, with his coaching, with his powerhouse teams, the Blue Raiders at St. Mike's. He coached the likes of Leo Routens, who went on to the University of Syracuse and received a uh, scholarship there and then was the first round draft choice of the 76ers. So Leo, who's now an analyst with the Raptors, knows what a great man and coach uh, Dan Prendergast uh, was. So we uh, say goodbye to Dan and also his uh, late wife Sharon Marie Flanagan and is survived by his daughters Aaron, Kelly, Daniel and Ryan who all attend at St. Mike's. Anyways, goodbye Dan. You were one of the best. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from uh, Elgin Middlesex London. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, as many of us know, November is Diabetes Awareness Month. During the month, we reflect on this uh, prevalent chronic condition and how it affects many Ontarians throughout the province. Over 1.5 million Ontarians, or 10.2 per cent of our population, suffer from diabetes. By 2025, that number is expected to rise to 2.3 million Ontarians, or 13.4 per cent of the province population. With proper knowledge and treatment, many of those afflicted with diabetes can lead healthy lives. Until a cure is discovered, preventing the onset of negative health effects due to diabetes is key. All diabetics should follow and know the ABCs of care. A is the A1C. Knowing your A1C allows you to know the average blood sugar level over the last few months. B is for blood pressure. Blood pressure control is just as important as blood sugar control. High blood pressure increases the risk of heart failure, stroke, and kidney of diabetics. C is for cholesterol. It's important to keep cholesterol levels in check as high cholesterol levels can also lead to a higher incidence of a heart attack and stroke. Diabetics in this province must know that they are eligible for coverage of routine eye examinations so that they can be monitored for any retinopathy that may occur. Diabetics are also prone to kidney disease as well as neuropathy. Diabetes Awareness Month reminds us to make the necessary lifestyle modifications such as healthy food choices, being active, stopping smoking and losing weight to help prevent the onset of diabetes. I'd like to thank all those involved with the Canadian Diabetes Association and all the volunteers who work hard to advocate and help those with diabetes throughout our province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On November the 6th, I, together with the Minister of Transportation, the MPP and the MP for York Centre, attended the launch of the Highway of Heroes Living Tribute at the Forensic Services and Coroners Complex in Downsview, the beginning of the Highway of Heroes. On the same day, the MPP for Northumberland Quinty West attended a similar ceremony with the base commander and staff at CFB Trenton at the highway's end. The tribute will plant one tree along the Highway of Heroes for every fallen Canadian soldier, 117,000 in all. How fitting that we honour and remember our fallen heroes with a living legacy along this highway, symbolically bringing them back to the land they died to defend. This project was first brought to my attention in the fall of 2014 by Mark Cullen. I had the distinct pleasure of meeting Mark at a community tree planting event in Oshawa, organized by Trees Ontario, as part of our government's 50 million tree program. Mark's obvious passion for the Highway of Heroes Living Tribute had me engaged from the beginning, and we worked together alongside a number of partners over the past year. Mark established the Living Tribute website and partnership and worked with stakeholders, including the MTO. I'd like to thank him and his executive director, Scott Brick, for their dedication to this project. I'd also like to thank everyone who so diligently worked to get this project where it is today, especially our partners at Trees Ontario and Trees for Life. I know that all Ontarians will be proud of this wonderful initiative. Indeed, I know, too, that generations of Canadians may one day bask in the shade of these beautiful trees, a legacy to our veterans. As they travel along the Highway of Heroes, I hope they will feel a deeper connection to every single one of our fallen heroes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. November is Diabetes Awareness Month. Diabetes is a serious condition that affects more than 10 million Canadians, including 1.5 million Ontarians, and costs approximately $14 billion and rising to Canadians annually. In 10 years, the number of Ontarians living with diabetes is expected to increase to 2.3 million. The Canadian Diabetes Association is helping those affected to live healthier lives, preventing the onset and consequences of diabetes, and discovering a cure. 
The association has called for increased public awareness regarding OHIP-insured yearly eye exams for adults living with di diabetes and increased access to offloading devices to help treat diabetic foot ulcers and reduce the at risk of amputation in people living with the disease. And as a nurse that has cared for many diabetic patients, I understand the value of these programs. Our government supports those living with diabetes through many initiatives. Ontario is the first province to introduce a publicly funded pediatric insulin pump program in 2006. It expanded to adults in 2008 when we introduced the Ontario Diabetes Strategy that supports diabetes prevention, cure, and care and management across the province. Recently, I visited the Pediatric Diabetes Clinic at the Cambridge Memorial Hospital in my riding. Nancy Easton, a certified diabetes educator, informed me that they have a team of medical and social service professionals to help maintain the health and wellness of these children and their families to prevent possible complications of diabetes. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's now time.